it record on this side somehow? Does it record it locally or? Ah, uh, no, it'll, it'll record it and then create it and I can send it to you after. In the cloud, okay. Yeah, um, we might, um, Sydney and Melbourne, um, as Josh was saying just before uh, everyone got on the call, he met Mel Redding in Sydney and he's been a regular mentor um, at our Brisbane campus and now he's uh, gone home to New Zealand and we get another international speaker, we can call it, which is awesome. Um, and he's had some really cool talks, so super excited to have him here. We can't clap, but I can clap. Welcome, Josh. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. So let me um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions as we go. And I'm just going to kind of give like some background context. <clears throat> and this is going to kind of be like a big picture talk. You know, uh, a lot of times I talk about um, tactics and kind of like context. And given the stage in history that we're in right now, like perfect timing, right? So first of all, I want to thank um, Steph for inviting me on and also to welcome the various people who are on the call right now. Uh, I know we have people from Brisbane and there are a few people who've, who I know and who know me from BrizJS and from previous mentor talks, this is Adam uh, and Luke. And uh, we have people also from Sydney as well. So wherever you're tuning in from right now, um, I. Thank you and welcome. So my name is Josh Wolf, and I'm a developer advocate at a company called Comunda, which is a business process management company uh, with its headquarters in Germany. And it's an international company. I'm the only employee of Comunda in the Australian New Zealand region. We have some people in Singapore, and then mostly our people are in the United States or in Europe. <clears throat> now. Uh, just to give you kind of my background, I was born in 1973 and uh, in Auckland, New Zealand, like about one suburb away from where I'm living now in a suburb called Mount Albert. And at that time, New Zealand was, you know, a, a, a recently kind of independent British colony post-World War II and England had entered into the, the European Union or the European Economic Community at the time. And prior to that, our whole economy in New Zealand was basically exporting like wool, uh, meat and uh, butter and dairy to England. And we were known as like England's dairy or England's pantry. So once they went into the European economic community, we lost that trading relationship and we had to rediscover like, what are we going to do? What's our future going to be? So I was kind of growing up in that environment. And in 1978 or 79, I went over to Sydney, Australia, where my grandparents were living. My mum took me and my brother over there. While we were over there, we saw the very first Star Wars movie. It came out in the theatres and it just like blew my mind and became kind of like a context for my life. Like this kind of science fiction idea about the future and what the future would be like. So I went to school and uh, a friend of mine his, his mother was a university professor and his father was a veterinary surgeon who owned his own practice. So they had like a lot of money and they bought the very first Apple Macintosh, which was in about, um, I think it might've been 85 or 84, 1984. And uh, so I just encountered this computer for the first time and fell in love with programming. And so my friend Rick and I, he's still here. He's a professional programmer. He does mostly Python these days. We just learned how to program together and got into programming and not really many people were into it back then. And we got, I got an 8-bit computer in Atari 800XL and uh, I got that in like 86, I think, or 85. And I, and I had a small handheld personal programmable thing called the Casio PB100, which had 544 bytes of RAM. It was basic programmable, so you could program it in basic, beginners, all-purpose, submolar construction code, which is like an old school programming language um, that was made in like 64, I think in Dartmouth and became very popular on those 8-bit micros. And yeah, I learned to program on that. Then I eventually ended up at university and took a computer science degree, but it was so early. It was 1992 that like a lot of people in my degree had never even touched a computer. And I'd by that stage have been programming for like eight years. And I was like, 
what am I even doing? So I switched to doing sociology, political science, and linguistics. And then I eventually went and did a, a night course at a tech institute, like a TAFE, on microprocessor programming and assembly language, and then got a job as a professional programmer in like 94 or 95. So I did that for a bunch of years. And um, Y2K came. So this was like the big apocalypse was coming. You know, all the COBOL systems were going to fail. Like nuclear missiles were going to launch automatically. Planes were going to fall out of the sky. I see Evelyn here's first language was MS Quick Basic. Yeah, it's a basic is like the perfect language for entry. Um, so yeah, Y2K came. And so from 98 to 2000, I worked as part of the global effort to avert Y2K from happening. And it was really like the golden years of IT because, you know, in any IT project, you got three kind of factors. You got like um, the, the amount of time that it takes, the scope of the project, and the cost of the project. And those are the only three things that you can play with, right? So you can't change the scope of the project for Y2K. It's like you have to check everything. Um, you can't change the time frame because Y2K is like a hard deadline. So the only thing that you can change is the amount of resources, which means that they were basically minting, like just printing money to pay people to work on Y2K projects. So it was ridiculous. I was working like 20 hours a week and getting paid like my equivalent of like a full-time wage um, as a contractor, just doing various gigs on these Y2K teams because every business had to do business as usual, BAU. And then they had to also do this like um, non-negotiable Y2K um, fiscalization uh, and, and modification of their systems. So they just had to pay whatever they could. And there was like hardly, hardly anyone around to do it. So one thing that's interesting about that is that that was my first experience of working with recruiters, 1998, 99. 2000 and I had a great experience because I was basically like a rock star and they were like my agents getting me gigs so I loved it then uh, in 2001 I my wife and I I got married in 98 and my wife and I moved to Lima Peru which is in South America and we lived in the, this desert city Lima and um, we did volunteer work there for three years so Lima is an interesting city because you have um the Andes and they're like super high mountain range. And then there's a hundred kilometers to the sea and it's all desert because that mountain range and the sea pushes all of the like um, moisture off this way. And then over this way into the Andes. So over the Andes, you have like jungle on the other side In the Andes, you have the mountainous region. Then you have this desert down here. So we lived in Lima. Um, I learned how to print books. I learned how to speak Spanish. I learned how to distribute books. And um, it's the other thing about that. Really the experience of like going from being like a highly skilled, highly paid professional, going to another country where I basically spoke the language like I was a three-year-old and it was like brutal. Like the experience for me personally of like, like it felt like I was wading through quicksand trying to get anything done, even to communicate with people, even just like having a conversation like this was um, difficult. Martin Valdivia, um, sí. <laughs> yeah, hablas español. Sí, yo hablo español. Damos y caballeros, muy buenos días y bienvenidos a esta charla hoy en día con yo, el que habla. Mi nombre es Josh Wolf. Um, so I actually got, uh, I went, I got, I got on the radio and I had a radio show in Lima twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.30 to 7.30. Um, and, you know, I did it for like a week or two and then I figured out that I could take um, calls. Donde esta la biblioteca? <laughs> um, I, I figured out I could take calls live on air. And so the first call rings up and he says, Está bien, pero no podemos entender nada que dice el gringo. In other words, hey, it's really great and everything, but we can't understand anything that the gringo says. So there was the school that I'd walked past a few times, and it was called like the Peruvian Academy of Locution of Juan Cifuentes in Miraflores. 
So I went in there and I said, listen, um, I've come over here. I'm doing volunteer work. You know, part of what I do is communicating with people. I'm on the radio and no one can understand what I'm saying. So um, I, you know, I went and did this, this locution kind of thing. And it really messed up my, um, the way that I speak, you know, it changed the way I think about vowels and um, also speaking in a way that people can understand me. So then at the end of my time there, so we were there for three years living in the desert. Um, our son was born there in L'Hospital Santa Rosa de Lima. Uh, he has a Peruvian passport and a New Zealand passport. And it was time to come back to this part of the world. And we had been sponsored to come to Brisbane. So I was thinking about, I was like, what do I want to do in the future? And I remembered that when I was working on the Y2K thing, working like 20 hours a week and like half of that time, I'm just reading Slashdot, right? So I just remembered all these people talking about this Linux open source thing. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to work with Microsoft technologies anymore. I want to work with this open source thing. So I go to a, a, a bookstore, which in Lima at that time, like in 2003, it looked like this. You walk into a shop. And there's a bunch of books there. And there's one there that says Red Hat Linux 9.0. And then I go, I want that book there. Then I pay the guy 15 soles, which is like about, um, at that time, sort of around five US dollars. And then I walk off for 15 minutes. And then I come back and he hands me a photocopy of the book because they have one copy of each book and a photocopier. And then they just photocopy the book and give you the copy. And then they just keep selling it over and over again. And that's like that for everything. So you want to buy like a DVD or a Mostly they were VCDs, so they were burned onto CDs at the time. You go there and they just have copies that they give you. So, um, oh yeah, Martin, you can learn Spanish, but being there, it's hard because everyone speaks slang and differently and super fast. That was one thing that I noticed when I got there, even though I, I, I couldn't really speak Spanish, was that um, it was it's spoken a lot faster. And uh, the other thing about it is the Spanish that I had learned to speak was from Microsoft Encarta. And so apparently when I got there, I found out that I'd actually learned to speak like a Mexican gangster. <laughs> so I was like, buen on the muchachos, which is kind of like, um, you know, what's up? Um, uh, what's up? I, I don't know how you'd say it. What's up, my... Homie. That's it, homie. What's up, homies? Yeah, yeah. What's up, homies? Um, it's called Herga, and they have different slangs in different parts of the country. And then they get, I was talking to a, we're digressing now, but I was talking to an Uber driver who's from Peru, from Lima. And he said he went back there and he said, dude, like the language is mutating so fast. It's like Herga of Herga. And you have that kind of thing in Australia and Cockney rhyming slang, right? Like say, say he's brown bread, which means he's dead. Um, so anyway, I got the book about the Red Hat Linux, and I was like, this is the future, open source. So I bought that book. I got the Red Hat Linux disk. I installed it on the computer that I had, and then we moved shortly afterwards to Brisbane, and I ended up working um, in an ISP, just like the equivalent of flipping burgers, you know, like changing people's passwords. You know, are you sure that your modem is not plugged in? Can you please just check to have a look? okay, the cables become disconnected. Okay, great. You know, that was basically those two things, unplugged cable and password resets. And then I said to my boss, look, I need to get a job somewhere else. Uh, I'm not making enough money here. Um, and he just, like two or three days later, he just said to me, how would you like to work at Red Hat? And he'd gotten an email from Red Hat saying that they were having a careers fair. So I was like, yes, that's a totally it. Yeah, exactly. If you tried turning it off and on again. So uh, I so I went to the careers fair and then got a job at Red Hat and I worked at Red Hat for the next 10 years and did like a bunch of different things across the whole Red Hat product stack, open source. Um, what really propelled Red Hat into this point where they sold for $39.1 billion to IBM was the, the, the crash of 2008, the GFC. So... On the day of the GFC, when that happened, I walk into the office and my boss, uh, who's director of that division, he just says to me, like, dude, like the states, like just the bottoms fell out of the market and like uh, Lehman Brothers has gone under. And the Lehman Brothers were like a, a major customer of ours. So what Red Hat's kind of revenue looked like was you had like five or six or 10 customers who were like 
all of the mass of it and then like thousands of customers who were the, like the long tail but it was like most of our revenue came from a few big customers and like they were just they were going under goldman sachs you know um lehman brothers um whatever that other big one was was it prudential or they were like they were a ship underwriter for since the 1800s maybe bear stearns yeah um was it barclays or something they were based in london Anyway, they all went under, right? And we were like, okay, we could be tanked right now, but we made it through Lloyd's. That's it, Lloyd's Shipping Insurance. Um, but we made it through on the other side. And then in Australia, we didn't feel the impact of the GFC, right? Because our our primary there was like um, selling, basically selling minerals to China, which were fueling their economic growth at the time. And then the government like pumped out a thousand dollars in a stimulus package to, to stimulate the consumer economy at the time. But in the United States and a lot of other places, it wiped off a lot of people's wealth. It really reduced a lot of consumer confidence and spending. And one of the things that that did was people started looking for lower cost alternatives for IT solutions, which equals Red Hat's open source offerings. So, um, What's probable out of the global market crash that we have right now is that open source companies will come out on the other side, assuming they can make it through, like just minting it. But one of the things that you can probably bet on is that it's going to be two to three years to get to the other side of this. So the company that I work for, you know, um, has done projections and, and we were in like a mass growth mode, like growing as fast as possible with like, um, growth capital behind us and as this whole thing started to unfold we 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 were on meetings like 130 of us like worldwide you know on zoom and looking at projections like you know what we're switching from grow as fast as possible to sustain as long as possible to make it through to the other side of this and uh ryan's just talking about uh red hat monetizing open source by selling support to the open source <clears throat> yeah they do sell support to the open source but the the difficulty with that just a pure support model is that it doesn't scale very well because as you get more support requests and you have to do more support you have to hire more people so a, lo a lot of Red Hat's value proposition is in the engineering, like the security of the engineering. Um, one, what we call one throat to choke. Like, you know, there's all of this open source software out there and then Red Hat brings it all together, packages it, tests it, integrates it, certifies it, certifies it on partner hardware, um, guarantees that it's going to be secure, that it meets like whatever kind of federal requirements. And so you're paying for all of that. And, that's the kind of part of the business where you do that once and then you can resell that value prop over and over and over again. Whereas like for the, for the front end support where people are ringing up and saying, how do I, you know, get my sand to work, that kind of stuff that, that doesn't scale as a business. So for us to find that sweet spot in that business model was like a, a, a discovery. And funnily enough, we have Colin Kenner talking about scaling startups on Friday. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, sorry. Interrupting. Go on. I think no, you're no, talking you're right. about um, your online. Getting through and taking two, two to three years. Yeah. Like I'm a, um, I'm a real student of history, you know, like in, in university, I'd already been programming for eight years. I went to the classes and was like, you know what? Like these people haven't touched computers before. I'm, I'm in the wrong place. So I switched to political science, sociology, and linguistics. And I've always been fascinated with studying history and historical forces. And if you have a look at like what's going on in our region, and this is, this is kind of good to give you some context of what it is that you're likely to encounter over this next period. You know, so you can kind of like be sort of like mentally prepared, not surprised and just like lean into it and relax, you know. So the first thing is that um, in the 80s, when I was learning to program, my friend's parents were always saying to me like, oh, this is just like you're perfectly set up for the future. This is going to be the future. And it wasn't really until maybe a few, maybe two or three years ago that my friend, um, Tim, 
who had gone, his first job out of high school was working on Lord of the Rings as like building sets and miniatures. And then he became a project manager. And then he went to work for Peter Jackson and Peter Jackson's company that restores World War I biplanes. And he worked on restoring a World War I tank. And then he became a yoga teacher. Uh, and then he became a software developer. And he learned how to do Drupal. He joined a startup that was um, a German American startup that was, they went to 500 startups. So he joined of a, from a Facebook ad. He was a Facebook ad come program in paradise. So he joined from that ad. They interviewed him over the internet. And then he was about to fly to Thailand where they were based. And then they said, no, don't fly to Thailand, fly to San Fran. Cause we just got accepted into 500 startups. So he flew over to San Francisco, couch surfed for three months, went through 500 startups with them, and then went back to Thailand and was there for two years. But they entered into that kind of zombie march zone where they're not like massively scaling and they're not like crashing enough to die. They're just kind of in between and just kind of going. And he was like, you know what? I'm over it. Um, I want to do something else. So he moved to Brisbane where I was at the time and we started working on something. And now he works... Um, for like a, a, a digital consulting company in Brisbane. So you are in the perfect place right now to make this transition into this new economy of the world and the new kind of geopolitical structure, like getting into programming. So yeah, Tim said to me, um, you know, having worked in those other industries, which I've never really worked in like, you know, as a carpenter or like set construction or anything like that. He was just like, dude, this is awesome, man. Like being a computer programmer, you're just like in like the Uber, the super um, upper class of, you know, professionals. And it's not like you have to do like seven years, you know, to learn how to be a doctor or something like that. You can just do a TAFE course and like just learn yourself like in your own time. And then, you know, you're in demand, you can get a job, all that kind of stuff. And look, you might have the experience when you first take it on of, especially if you do have a background in another um, industry, right? Like if, if you're transitioning from another professional career where, where you've been, like last time I spoke in Brisbane, there was a guy there who had been a DJ, um, another guy who had been working as like a crane operator. So people transition into this. Some people are coming straight into it out of school done a degree, want to do something different, look, looking at this. Other people already have a career like, you know what, I want to do this instead. So you might have the experience of being like that kind of like five-year-old, you know, like when I went to Peru and I was like, I went from being like a highly paid, respected professional to being like an idiot, like a village idiot, you know, like people literally ringing up the radio station and going, hey, we can't understand anything this guy says. Um you know, you have that experience, right? Where everything is a struggle. It's really difficult. And then there's this 20 year old, um, just like blazing past you. And you're just like, God, is it, is it ever going to be any different to this? And you know what? Look, it is. You just got to go through it. Right. And where we are now in this region of the world, we are about to go through that together. Like literally like, um, when there is a when there is a global market crash, the only real precedent that we have for that is like looking back to the 1930s. And what happens post global market crash is that there is like a significant geopolitical restructuring of the world. So, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, right? And I don't have like um, an inside kind of um, source or anything like that. I'm just a student of history. And as soon as the global market crash started to happen, I just immediately thought in my head, like, you know what, when I was in school and like studying history, I always said to myself, how did the global markets crash in the thirties? It wasn't like a meteorite hit the earth. Right. And like wiped out like production capability. So it is in some sense, like a second order effect of like market derivatives, you know, like if you've seen that movie, the big short about how, you know, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the big short, but I recommend watching that so you can understand a little bit about how markets work. And also here's the thing, how you can make money while the market is going down, which is what's happening. And when you're talking about like complete global market collapse, and 
especially in a situation where there is a rising power and a declining power in the world, you end up with a geopolitical restructure. Now, the last time that this happened was in the 30s and the 40s. And at that time, you had the British Empire, right? And the sun never sets on the British Empire. Like, that's how in, unthinkable it was that the British Empire could ever be eclipsed, right? Leading into that whole thing. They were just like, nah, that's ridiculous. Like, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Now, on the other side of it, you end up with the British Empire, like, fully gone, right? But there were some echoes, some remnants afterwards, and U.S. became the dominant superpower. Now, if you look at the echoes or the remnants that remained beyond the Second World War of the British Empire, you've got like New Zealand, Australia, and pretty much um, you're going to Hong Kong um, and uh, Rhodesia that became Zimbabwe. So in New Zealand, we were like, oh, how do we find our way? What are we going to become in the world? Then we lost our favored trading partner status with England. It was like cutting the ties, the strings. And then the thing that kept Australia and New Zealand out of Asia at that time was like a U.S. strategic um, shield. And as we move into this market crash, you know, what's very clear is that China is rising as a dominant economic force in this region. And we really are like the British colonies that got caught offside in Asia after the Second World War. And then in Africa, you had like um, Rhodesia. And in Rhodesia, after the Second World War, Britain was like, we're divesting the colonies. They're going to become independent. They're going to like, kind of like participate in the regions where they are. So, um, you know, we were really kept out of that dynamic with Asia because of the presence of the U.S. empire in this area. But for um, Africa, which was didn't have that, these guys in that colony there, they were just like, no, nah, we're not going to do it. And they declared unilateral independence from England in 1965 and said, we're not doing it. We're not switching to a majority government. And then they fought a war over the next 15 years, like uh, across two borders and internally and um were like economically sanctioned for the entire time and then at the end of it in 1980 they just ended up where they were going to end up anyway so it was kind of a waste of time so it was kind of like historical forces right like that's an example of a colony that got caught offside and just like re re resisting the forces of history it's like you just got to lean into it and accept it you know so um, the thing here is, uh, yeah, like, you know, Carl's pointing out that it's always the victors, you know, Winston Churchill said like, um, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. <laughs> and it is a fact that you will always hear that it's the victors, you know, like I can give you a very clear example of that. Right. So, you know, the, the story that you hear about the, the rise of, uh, militaristic Germany in the thirties is like hyperinflation hits the country. People are lining up to buy bread with a bar a wheelbarrow full of notes, right? Like to buy a thing of bread. And then while they're waiting in the line, the price of the bread is going up, you know, because the, the value of the money is like going through the floor. Now, if you want to get a sense of what's likely to happen in the environment we're in now, there's a guy called Ray Dalio that you should um, Google him up. I'm going to put his name into the chat. And 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 read about his he has one called like what's the effect of coronavirus on the global economy and um so many questions stacking up okay so let me just um complete this thought uh for the next two minutes and then we'll go to the questions so uh yeah so when you look back at it like somehow this country germany builds itself up and then goes to war with the whole world but supposedly they were so broke that people had to buy bread with like wheelbarrows full of money and then as i was in history class looking i was like how does a country that's that broke suddenly have this military machine that can take on the whole world i mean come on um that came from somewhere someone was selling them that stuff but you know you don't get to see that looking back right because history is written by the victors and it's written in such a way that it tells the narrative in such a way. But, you know, look, we're in history right now. What's pretty clear to me is like, this is my call that I'm making and what I'm doing myself. Um, I've been building stuff on AWS for the last 10, 15 years. Um, I've started building stuff on AliCloud now because my 
pick for this region is that uh, China is going to become like a major market for us and like in terms of like selling into and also working on solutions for companies out of there. So it's going to become more and more a dominant kind of like um, feature of, of our socioeconomic kind of trade and stuff. So my pick is AliCloud, AliPay. Okay, what, what um, is that, let's, go to, let's go to the questions. Oh yeah, cool, sounds good. Ali, Alipay, so Alipay is like Stripe, yeah. Let me, give you, let me just give you a quick story. So my wife and I have been married for 22 years as of um, April the 18th. And a couple of months ago, we went into Michael Hill Jewelers and we, we ordered some new wedding rings to replace um, our other ones, new ones. And they, they got them together. They sent them off to be reshaped, you know, to the right sizes. I paid the deposit. And then the whole shutdown happened. Michael Hill Jewel was completely shut down. Then I left um, Australia, came to New Zealand. I got in touch with them. Finally, they called me. And they said, yeah, you can pay the difference and we'll send them over to you. And they sent me a link to do it. I clicked on the link to pay for them. And it popped up and it had a number of payment methods. There was PayPal, credit card. But the number one and the default was Alipay which is um, like Stripe or PayPal, but it's all, you know, through that Ali, Ali Cloud, Alibaba's. So Ali, Ali Cloud is like AWS is to Amazon, Ali Cloud is to Alibaba. And they got like a $40 billion investment to continue building out their cloud like a few weeks ago. So while the rest of the world is tanking, like that is like going up. So that's oh the region God. that we're in geographically in the world. Crazy, crazy. Uh, and, and look, you know, we're all going to have that experience of like being five-year-olds because the disadvantage we're at is that we are now an English-speaking country in a, a, a Chinese sphere and um, starting economically from like with our economy shut down from very low. So, um, you know, we're all going to go through that over the next couple of years. And it's just like, I'm just like leaning into it. You know, I did it in Peru. Um, I can do it again. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again, beginner's mind. It's exciting in a way. Um, all right, so yes, I don't know is. how you want to go about it. There's so many there. You don't have to do them in order. If you read one out, I'll just cross it out so we're kind of keeping track. Um, uh, maybe could you read them out? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, list of them. Um, what are your tips okay. on starting to contribute to open source? Okay, so um, you find something that's, interesting for you um that that you're interested in and that you like and you just start using it and then the first thing that you do is as you're using it and to begin with you like oh you know like they missed out um this installation step in the readme and then you just like click on the edit button on the readme and then add the thing and it says you're committing to a repo that you don't have commit access to. We're going to put it in a fork and open the pull request. And you say, yep. And then you've opened your first pull request. So, you know, documentation is the easiest one to start with. Then you will find bugs um, or usability, even usability bugs. Like I expected it to do this, but it does that. And you open that or you find something that actually is a bug. And then eventually you start fixing things. So you just find something like, I, for example, I built something using Svelte the other day. So I've used um, React a bunch for front end, Ember, and I started using Svelte for the first time. And uh, oh, here we go. Gary's also mentioning firsttimersonly.com. Good resource for getting into open source for that first time. Yeah, so really your own motivation will drive you forward. So it's finding what, what motivates you, what you're keen on and linking that to, to something. But that, 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 that would be my first thing is like your installation instructions, getting started instructions. Don't just like notice that something's wrong and do nothing about it. Like be a good citizen and like, you know, tidy up the environment as you go. I know this is going to lead us to another little tangent, but it's super interesting. Would you mind giving everyone just a little overview about how you got your job at Kamunda? Okay. So um, I was working in a financial services company in Brisbane. And at some point we were like, we're going to build a new version of our platform. 
And I went and talked to a guy there who was an architect, but who didn't have much influence in the day to day running of the company, but he was a real smart guy, but he was in a corner and he, yeah, he had a lot of thought and a lot of considerate, well considered thought. And so I, I interviewed him myself and, and another team member. We sat down and asked him about it. And he had like a real vision for this thing and it used an orchestration engine. So then we looked into different engines and I compared Netflix Conductor and um, Kamunda ZB, which was a new microservices orchestration engine. Now I did a few different tests. I did load testing. So I built a POC system with each of them and load tested it. Second thing that I did was I looked at the GitHub issues, how often the projects were committed to and how fast they responded to issues. And I opened issues and I also opened pull requests against both projects because one of the things I wanted to measure was their level of engagement with the community because there's, there's kind of two things. There's like where something is now and there's like where it's going and how fast it's moving there. So you got to measure both of those things momentum as well as position and so yeah we worked on zb and then we decided that we were going to use zb and there was no javascript client for zb so i wrote one and open sourced it and you know i i was obviously working closely with the engineers in in the open source world and this is kind of an example of um how you do open source to the point where you end up working at a company is you basically in open source you can basically be doing the job and then they just start paying you to do it um at red hat that was how the way we did it we didn't like pay people to work on the stuff we like paid the people who were working on the stuff to do it for us so i just adopted the same kind of approach with Commander. i just was like i really love this it's really cool working on it you know working on it during my work hours at work, working on it at night, working on it in the weekends. And then they were in growth mode and hiring developer advocates. So I applied and uh, got the job. That's awesome. Um, okay, so different direction. Advice about landing your first gig as a junior or a five-year-old. Yeah, okay. Um, This one's a little this one's a little challenging for me, right? Because I I can give you an answer from the previous context, but like we got to really get that we're in a discontinuous context right now. And this is not even like there was a discontinuity, like, you know, the global economy crashed and we're in a depression. We're suddenly all like locked down in our homes and working remotely electronically, you know, and I know that we do hear that like, oh, we're going to be releasing, we're going to be returning to normal. But one of the things about it is that the second order effects of what has already happened are going to cause further discontinuities. Like if you think back, because we've kind of normalized to it now, right? But if you think back to like the extreme uncertainty, the like WTF kind of moments of like, you know, lockdowns. And, you know, I just remember on March the 30th, we went to the airport with 120 kilograms of luggage between the three of us. There's only one flight leaving the country. It's just like a few, a few Kiwis and like the army and the border force are the only ones there. And I was just like, dude, I'm in a sci-fi movie right now. And then <laughs> flying into New Zealand, like those kind of moments they're not, we're not finished with those. There are going to be more of those kind of moments. It's going to keep snowballing now because just because of what's already happened. Um, yeah, that's going to keep happening. So it is challenging for me to, to answer that question based on the past. Mm -hmm. What I can say about it, you know, to give you something for the future is that, um, and Ray Dalio talks about this, you know, is it's really that innovative spirit. You know, when I went to Peru, I could not rely on anything from my past in New Zealand. You know, like I go from one minute being like this highly paid, highly respected, highly in demand, rock star, Y2K, like, you know, like the geek have inherited the earth. I'm like, you know, people are like rolling a red carpet in front of me and like fanning me with peacock fans and like, you know, 
paving the ground in front of me with gold. And then I go to living in this country that's like number 121 for corruption in the world. You know, 60% of the people are unemployed, which means that they're trying to sell stuff in the street, which means that they're just robbing people. Um, not speaking the language, <laughs> just like, now what? So the kind of things that stayed with me there were like being innovative, being solutions focused, having this mentality of like, I can do this, I can do this. Um, enterprising, like what are the tips for you getting your first job? It's like, it's just all mindset. It's not technical skills at all. And then here's the other thing that I'd offer to everyone on here is like, you know, when they went into that war in the second world war and they were like, you know, the Germans, this, the Germans, that listen, somebody sold a lot of all of that equipment to the Germans. So even though they made a story for the general public about how we're anti-German, um, someone made a lot of money from working with the German economy and the German people. So like whatever kind of situation we end up in this part of the world, like if you are thinking like that, you can, there'll be opportunities, there'll be ways for you to make money and make a living. And you don't need to get caught up in any kind of like public propaganda about anyone or anything. Yeah, such a good point. Um, okay, then what kind of companies do you prefer to work in? Uh, what are some of the key factors that attracts you to a company? Um, I'm just I'm kind of like laughing at some of these um, comments and the thing. <laughs> oh, the really? invisible I'm... hand of the free market might hear us talking about them. True story, you know, like you have to be like circumspect, you know. It's the, it is. I call it historical forces, right? Like they are historical forces. When you read the Wikipedia article, it's going to say, you know, the forces of history led us to this point. And it's like, you can read behind the lines um, however much you want, but it's uh, what attracts me to companies that I work for. Um, you know, like really they're, they're the mindset of the company, that they're forward thinking, that they, that, that they're also, here's the other thing is that they are also positioned in terms of historical forces. Like when I joined Red Hat, I was clear that the future was going to be open source. Um, when I joined Komunda, I was clear that the future is business process automation. And now that this has all happened here, I'm like, yeah, man, this is a company that has inherited the future. Um, at the moment, any kind of company that was like, that had like plans for selling into a Chinese language market would be like, I'd be all about that. Um, Yeah, I think anyone who any company if, if see if you ha, if there's a company and they're like we're building this thing on Ali Cloud and we're doing AliPay and like they're thinking like that, they're already like way ahead of the game. People who are thinking about like the past and the way things used to be, I'd be kind of like, uh, yeah, I don't know about that. Um business process automation right now. Uh what other kind of areas would be big in the future? Well, you know, and then at the same time, you can work for any company to get the skills that you need. And it's like a stepping stone. Like that company that I ended up in before I was at Komunda, it wasn't a good fit for me at all. Um, nothing wrong with the company. It just wasn't, it just wasn't the right fit. And in the end, I resigned from that company and it was like a mutual kind of thing between us. And they were just like, yeah, you know, like you're too kind of entrepreneurial and enterprising for this company. It's just not a good match. And I was like, yeah, yeah, you're right. And then I went to Komunda. So anywhere, anywhere is good. And then in terms of getting that first job, like um, especially once this economy is, you know, um, goes the way that it's going, it's like there's no point doing nothing, like being unemployed and doing nothing. If you're working, I know that it's always been a thing in Australia that people are like, no, you can't work for free, like, you can't do any any kind of work and not get paid for it but like that's the kind of thing that that the luxury that you can have with like a an economy with high wages and low unemployment in an environment with high unemployment and low wages man you got to hustle you got to hustle <laughs> you see the blog question um okay cool so there was another question saying like what are you doing during 
this time in COVID and what's on the agenda post COVID. Um, I mean, you've given a few kind of predictions or or what you think will be big. Do you have any other kind of tips or what, what's your plan like for the future in terms of career and stuff? Yeah, okay. So um, first thing that I did is I returned to my home country because the the messaging that I could hear coming through the media from the governments was pretty clear. It was like, everybody returned to your home country. And I was like, okay, I got the message. It's a reshuffle. <laughs> it's like a, it's a 1930s, 40 reshuffle about to happen. So it's like everybody return to, to base. So I did that. Um, uh, this one here from Caitlin, like about a blog and using it for investment advice. I got back here and I sat down and then I was talking to some friends and they were like getting into like conspiracy theories and stuff. And I was like, dude, who cares about like causes? It's about effects, man. We've got to be like practical. Um, yeah, here it takes a census. Yep, pretty much. Um, so practical about effects. I was like, you know, we should be like looking ahead to see what we invest in. And um I started doing like a deep economic analysis, which is how I ended up looking at the, the geopolitical situation. Once I had a look at like a couple of things, where the money is and where the military forces are arrayed across the planet and the movements that have been happening in the last couple of months. Um, so in terms of like investment of like time, money, that kind of stuff, like Ray Dalio says cash is trash. It's going to hyperinflate just like it did with, um, uh, or deflate in value, just like it did uh, prior, you know, in, in a post crash in um, in Germany. So he was like, "Get get out of cash." Like, what I'm doing with my cash right now is, as soon as I get money, I immediately convert it into commodities, like food, for example. So Australia's energy security is um, like the energy. Uh, the International Energy Authority mandates that every member country should have 90 days of oil supply in the country. Uh, New Zealand has 90 days. Australia has between 20 and 34 days of oil. Oh. So it's particularly vulnerable to a shutdown in the South China Sea and the Strait of Hormuz. And most people are not looking at it, but if you look at the, the disposition of the military forces around the South China Sea and the Strait of Hormuz, it's like if the, the worst case scenario for Australia in the energy security documents is rated at 0.1% per year or 1% uh, over 10 years. That's how probable it is to happen, right? But what that scenario looks like is oil supply import to Australia gets cut and you're now operating on that 20 to 34 day um, reserve. And so food distribution logistics switch off like a light because it takes 25,000 truck trips to resupply Sydney alone per week. So the food might be in the country, but they can't get it to the supermarkets. And then in the service stations, you have three days worth of petrol, but that gets immediately shut down for like fire, ambulance, police. So that's like the worst case scenario in the planning. It's got a 1% chance over 10 years but when you look at the world right now, we have a global market shutdown. Um, we have this change in military force disposition. You have basically 98% of the preconditions for that scenario in place right now. So one of the things that I've been doing is like um, buying um, high density nutrient foods and just like stashing them so that I can keep you know, eating if I need to, time to invest in horses, diesel, yeah. domestic diesel production. Yeah. What are you, what are your thoughts just uh, on that as well? What are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin? Oh, see, that's another one. My friend has been buying crypto right now. If you read that book *Sapiens* by Yuval Noah Harari, in there he says that like um, the value of like money and stuff is is not in the actual thing itself. It's in other people's belief in the thing. So he gives the example of Osama bin Laden, right? And he says. Osama bin Laden doesn't believe in the United States. He doesn't believe in like the, the Christian God of the United States, but he does believe in US dollars. Like he likes them and he has heaps of them. And that's because he doesn't need to believe that they are true. He just needs to believe that other people believe that they're true. So cryptocurrency is of the same nature, right? It's like um, the value of a cryptocurrency is that other people will ascribe some kind of value to it. 
And because it's an actual finite resource, um, it, it can't be deflated um, or diluted the same way that fiat currencies can. Even gold-backed currencies, you can get more gold out of the ground. So I think if I was going to put my money into anything, um, I'd do cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And then apparently um, gold and silver are pretty solid, but you can't buy any physical gold or silver right now. It's pretty much all gone from the market. Mm -hmm. But yeah, cash right. is not going to be worth it. Yeah. Skills um, and abilities and mindset are what's going to be <laughs> like the, the worth everything. Um, completely different now. What is your secret to your energy and alertness? Secret to my energy and alertness? Um, I do go through periods of like low energy. Um, and like even being like, I wouldn't say depressed, but like having this kind of sense of like, oh my God, like the what's happening, you know, in the world and the historical forces and like, uh, um, but then I'm like, you know, it's like, it's a choice. Like it really is a choice. Um, how you see the world. It's like, is the glass half full or half empty? Like you can choose either of those. Um, and then you can create it for yourself. Like really like taking responsibility for that, you know, this negative kind of view of the world that I'm experiencing right now is actually something that I'm creating because the glass is both half full and half empty. It's like half full of water, half full of air, half empty of water, half empty of air. Um, then, then there's that other thing that says the pragmatist or the realist sees that it's tipped up and pouring out. It's like just going back to like looking at things actually as they are like that brings me a lot of like um, peace around it when I can see, oh, it's historical forces and here I am in the midst of the whole thing and I'm in one of the biggest Wikipedia articles of all time and I don't even have to do anything. It's like, yeah, just yeah. Um, people that you're with and enjoy life. And because you do some live coding on Twitch and I think um, a while ago you gave an example about how, you know, you can be really stuck on something um you know and feel like you're focused but also you just need to walk away and give yourself a second to think about that problem in a different way could you share some of your 100%. experience with that yeah sure so look i haven't done any live coding on twitch for like a month um you know i've been moving house and i was sharing with steph um at the beginning that my my pop-up green screen that i have is like in a container on its way over and I like literally have taken this week off work. You know, I talked to my manager and that thing I was building with Svelte last week was for a live demo. And I got it like 90% complete. Couldn't get that last part done in time. Jumped onto a meeting with my manager and the CTO. And I just said, look, you know, my experience in this last week has just been an experience of being trapped. Like, Part of the job that I love and that I got was that I can travel around the world. So I had a ticket to fly to New York on the 19th of April. And um, I should have been flying back to Brisbane like uh, yesterday, actually. It was my flight back. And obviously all of that got canceled. It's now no longer possible for me to travel anywhere. Like I, this year I went to Europe. Uh, I was in the Czech Republic and Germany. Um, I had that flight to New York. I had another flight to the US in June. Like it's all been canceled. So like that's gone the ability to travel like that even the ability to go outside my house and visit my mother is gone <laughs> so like i'm just like have this experience of being trapped you know um and then these historical forces that are like changing the shape of this region and then i was like and it's down into this like micro level of me being trapped inside trying to get this um this Lambda function to work in AWS. And then I'll, I'll go down a pathway of like debugging something. And whereas before I would have just gone like, nah, this is not it, abandon it, come back up and then, you know, try something else. Instead, I find myself deep down this rabbit hole and like the experience of being trapped and just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't do this. What is wrong with me? Like affected personally in my own effectiveness at that level. So, 
I jumped on the call with them and I shared with them, you know, like, yeah, I, I just really do have this experience of being trapped right now, trapped in the world, trapped in my house, trapped in this problem, can't solve it. And I said, look, I need to get outside and like connect with the environment that I'm in because I like flew into this country where I haven't lived for, for like 20 years. It's like I was in Brisbane for 16. We were in South America for three before that. I've flown into this country where I haven't lived for 20 years and moved into this house and I haven't like connected with, I haven't been to see my family or anything. I've like talked briefly to a couple of neighbors. I haven't been out into the environment, even connected with like the physical environment that I'm in. And here I am trying to work on my computer. Like, dude, you know, I saw a tweet and it said, you're not at home working during a crisis. You are at home during a crisis trying to work. So if ever there was a time where you got to take care of your like emotional well-being and like your connection with other people, like you got to you got to pay more and more deliberate attention to that. Like before, I was working because I work with an international team in like Europe and in uh, the US, and I'm the only employee in this geographical region. I'm working like late nights, long hours long periods of time with very little human interaction and i was crushing it before but now in this current environment um i just continued to do it because i was like you know what like my life is already perfectly set up for this i work remotely i don't have to rely on going to an office i got everything set up i've got like a very small kind of social life that you know pretty much got stopped when this whole thing happened not a big deal like i just i'm already perfectly set up for it and I just continued going the way I was before without actually like taking into account or acknowledging that I'm not at all in the same macro environment that I was before and acting like I was like didn't work. Like I, I really needed to take more. It's the lack of the option. Exactly. Jake. It's like, you know, I, I can't, you know, I can't go out to do whatever, but before I could, if I wanted to, but now I just can't. And like loss of control is one of the major factors in burnout, whether it's loss of control in your job, with your manager, with your company, with your country. Like I've changed my, my job and my manager, my company are great. I change countries, but like just a complete lock, loss of control. Yeah, exactly. I just want to go to the pub. You know, I came to the Coder Academy end of year thing last year down in the valley, right? And, you know, I might, I might not want to go, but at least I could if I wanted to, but now I can't go even if I want to. And if I don't want to go, it's like, yeah, I have no choice. Yeah. And it's, take my computer it's, to a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> it's something to, you know, like everyone here is making a transition and studying. And, and I think it's really important to remember how, remember that we are in a crisis and give yourself that time. Um, but also remember yes. like, we're all getting through this together and even though you know like you said Josh you were smashing it and then now it's been hard like everyone is experiencing whether it's a form of burnout imposter syndrome and you know on the other side of this the ladder at the end of the tunnel no matter how far away it is if it's if it's next week or two years from now um like you can kind of think how how well you can be crushing it um if you know if you're coping now and still understanding that there has been some tough times um, you're getting through it. Like, imagine how good you're going to be kind of when when your environment around you is normal, to, so to speak. Yeah, this is like the best training and development opportunity that you could ever have. And yeah, it's like Steph said, you got it's a choice, you know, and you got to like, um, first of all, acknowledge it. And then the next thing is like, lean into it, like, just relax into it. It's happening. This is the life that we're living. These are the people that we're living it with. So just love the people around you, lift them up, lift each other up, um, be kind to yourself, take the time you need, get sunlight, get fresh air, um, and then just come back again and hit it. And like, you know, it might be weeks or it might be two or three years, but whichever one that it is, just know that like you have what it takes and you're going to get through this. Mm -hmm. And it's so exactly right. Like you might not have even done it before, but just because you can't do it now, it's so tough. Um, I might finish on one last question, Josh. It's around your productivity for working at home. 
Um, I know you had some good strategies and I guess right now it is a different situation, but how did you go before working from home, working remotely, working in a different time zone? Um, I just loved it. <laughs> but um, now it's like, uh, I think like, especially like paired coding, like if you can jump on Zoom or um, whereby.com is another great one platform. What was that one? Um, or you can use, it's called whereby. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it into the tr chat. Um, okay. You can use that. And the other thing you can use is the peer coding, um, paired coding um, feature in Visual Studio Code and just open a voice channel with someone else and just work on something together in real time. I don't know how much you guys are doing that at the moment, but like that, that's like, that makes all the, all the differences, like just having that human connection and like getting outside of your own head and just being in a kind of a shared kind of auditory thinking space with uh, other people it makes a huge mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. Um, okay. Maybe one more thing. We've, we've, we've got a little bit, a tiny bit of time. We're only a bit over. What's been the most exciting okay. or the coolest, coolest project that you've ever worked on? Um, most exciting or coolest project I've ever worked on. Okay. Well, the Y2K thing was like friggin' awesome. It was like, it was an, it's a wiki, it's another Wikipedia article kind of thing, right? It was like a worldwide effort to avert the apocalypse at the time. Now people are like, Y2K was like a hype up and everything. But I was like, dude, there was like literally hundreds of thousands of us working for two years around the world to make sure that it didn't happen. That was one. And then the other one was this, um, federal security certification for uh, a middleware product at Red Hat. And the way that happened is my boss calls me into his office and he goes, listen, I'm going to need you to um, do a favor for, he's kind of like the godfather, this guy. He's like, I'm going to need you to do a favor for me. <laughs> I'm like, sure. What's up? He's like, I need you to fly to the U S tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, okay. It's like in December. Right. So I jump on this plane to fly to the U S because he says to me, like, I got this budget for this project and, like, we need to have someone at this meeting. So I jump on this plane, I fly to the U.S., I get off the plane in Boston and it's snowing and I'm wearing friggin' shorts and a T-shirt. So just flown from December in Brisbane without even thinking about it, I just jump on the plane. It's, like, midnight, snowing. Um, the, the, the van takes me out to this hotel 50 kilometers from Boston. I go to sleep, wake up in the morning, this looks like snow everywhere i'm like wasted as anything put some clothes on pay these mexican guys 50 us dollars to drive me to the red hat office and then go into this meeting with this german security firm with absolutely no idea what i'm doing there or what we're talking about and i'm just sitting there and they're having this meeting and i'm trying to figure out what we what it is that we're doing um and i'm like drinking hot drinks while i'm doing it and just like what am I doing here? What am, I'm like trying to fake that I know what the pro, like you want to talk about imposter syndrome. Um, and then I went outside and rolled around in the snow, which was awesome. And then after about a day or two, I did figure out what it was that we were doing. We were doing like a security audit of this product to get like a federal um, uh, certification. So that, that was like, yeah. What an experience. That's crazy. Um, so there were a ton of questions that we did miss, but I'm going to ask people to contact you on Twitter if they really want them answered. They were around, what are your yeah. tips for uh, for bigger traps? Um, what do you reckon bigger best traps? point to start your <laughs> online business? Um, those books, have you ever read Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall? So many. So guys, if you didn't get these answered, please reach out to Josh on Twitter. It, the link is in the shared notes, um, but I do want to wrap it out, wrap it up, and say a big thanks. Um, Josh is super well connected, not only in Brisbane but clearly globally. <laughs> um, so you know, if you ever have any questions, um, there's just utilize our network, and and everyone's so friendly. So I think as long as that's okay with you, Josh, if, if anyone asks you questions on Twitter 100%. at some point. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, you know, whatever whatever I can offer and whatever difference I can make, I'm more than happy. Thank you for the opportunity. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, big applause to Josh and um 
Yeah, we might have to get you in for another um, history thing because uh, that is crazy interesting, especially where it leads for tech. So crazy. Yeah, <laughs> look, I think we're going to see some big evolutions between now and May. And like, if I come back and do something in May, we're going to be in a different world by that stage. Absolutely. So yeah, I can definitely come back. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Um, enjoy the rest of your day.